Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Dental Up Podcast, brought to you by Keating Dental Arts, a full-service, award-winning dental laboratory. Each week, you'll learn tips and techniques from real-world dentists, bringing you in-depth interviews, motivating stories, current events, and sports. Here is your special host, the Senior Technical Advisor for Keating Dental Arts, Brandon Fetters. Hey everybody, Brandon here. Welcome to another episode of the Dental Up Podcast. Our guest this week is a well-respected dentist, lecturer, speaker, and author of two books, The Miracle of Health and Fit for the Love of It. He is also a certified nutrition and wellness specialist, a certified holistic lifestyle coach, and he is triple certified as a personal trainer and a member of the American College of Sports Medicine. Currently practicing from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, please welcome Dr. Uchi Ariatu, DMD. How's it going, Dr. Ariatu? Good, good. I'm always excited to share my message and my insights with my colleagues, so um, I'm raring to go. Awesome. Now, um, when, when did you decide to get into dentistry? Was that pretty early on? Yeah, great question. You know, I was in university. I was actually, I got my undergraduate degree was in psychology mm-hmm. and I had about three years of psychology and some chemistry and biology courses. And then believe it or not, I, I met a, a, a dental student in the gym. So here I am not even knowing what I want to do yet. I'm, I'm 20. I've been in university for three years. And um, this dentist who was in first year dental school came up to me in the gym and asked me what I did. And I said, I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm in psychology courses. He started raving about his first year dental school experience. And I'm thinking, hey, that sounds pretty good. So I was thinking about medicine, but den- dentistry sounds very much like a, a lifestyle profession. It's got all the arts and sciences. I had some psychology, which I'm passionate about. And then he told me about some chalk carving I might have to do. And I'm thinking, like, you know, I'm, I can draw well. Uh, the next minute I'm applying. Next minute I, um, I'm in. I, my interview went well, and all of a sudden I'm in first year dental school. And I got a end up getting a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and a minor in Chemistry. And, and where did you attend school? Uh, the University of Manitoba. So um, it's in Canada. So it's, it's right in the smack in the middle of Canada. So it's, it's a province right above North Dakota, mm-hmm. give you a, any kind of a geographic. But technically, it's supposed to be the geographic center of North America. So they have tons of call centers in this uh, very cold city. But it's uh, a great city to have grown up in and went to school in and... Uh, and uh, the, the dental school class was small. It was only about 25 people. But you really couldn't hide, and you definitely weren't under the radar. So if you weren't good at doing um, some procedure, everyone knew, So, uh, which is good and bad. You, you definitely got out of school knowing all the, all, the, all the procedures, but you definitely could not be under the radar. Everyone knew you, and everyone knew your name and, and what your strengths and weaknesses were. That's awesome. Now, when, when you went to leave school, did you start off as an associate, or did you purchase your own practice? No, actually, not. I started working for um, uh, the government of Canada. I wanted to oh. um, have a neat experience. Someone told me about how great it was to fly up in northern remote regions of Canada. So what I did was um, every I, I tendered a contract. I did. I got it. And I flew up to northern Canada every Monday morning on these little planes. Mm-hmm. Came back on Friday afternoon. I got paid. Um, for me, it was a huge um, daily rate. But, um, you know, you basically put your life in danger. These little, you know, two to... 10 seater planes and I flew into basically um, work in northern communities. So I basically did a lot of, you know, extractions and fillings and hygiene, but you got very confident very quickly because there was no one to ask anyone's opinion. Like I did refer people out to specialists as needed, but um, I was the go-to guy in a town of 800 or a town of 400 or a town of 1200. So uh, you got confident, you got very good at anesthetic very quickly. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I, I worked out of nursing stations. So, um, right away, I was immersed into being able to explain terminology to nurses and uh, triaging emergencies, and uh, it, was, it was great. I enjoyed it. about uh, two or three years of doing that. It was a lot of fun. Gotcha. Did, was there any procedure that you found that's your favorite? Um, I, I really saw myself connecting with – I love the human interest side, and I think a big part of my interest in psychology and uh, in undergrad uh, lent itself well. And the procedures – you know, I've – I, I have decent hands, you know, I, I clinically, I'm totally fine. I've been to Panky. I've done a number of other different courses. However, um, I love the human story. I love getting to know someone, the person behind the crown, behind the denture, behind the endo. And I found that has always been intriguing to me. And I think some, that's why it's lent itself well to do my lectures, because even nowadays, I say that people never leave their marriage, their job, their stress level, their dietary habits in the car when they come into the chair. 
And as dentists, we often don't think about it. We just kind of do the crown, we do the root canal, we do the full mouth rehab. But we never realize we're working on someone who's a shift worker. Or we never realize we're working on someone who eats, you know, junk food all day. Or we realize we're not working on, we're working on someone who has lots of stress. And they never heal the same way as someone who sleeps at night, loves their job, and eats fruits and vegetables. So I learned early on the, how important it was getting to know people is. And to this day, it's one of, one of my passions in my lectures to share with people how important the human story is and how it impacts uh, the healing process and the treatment outcome. Now, um, you, you mentioned previously about outsourcing. What type of procedures were you outsourcing? Um, I don't know. The federal government liked what I did. They, I did a lot of stuff on site, but um, anything I found that I didn't either enjoy or I didn't have the, the equipment to do on site, I would, I would um, source out to um, uh, specialists in the city. Gotcha. Now, speaking of the, uh, the equipment, what are your thoughts on CAD CAM technologies and impression scanners? No, I, I love them. Uh, we, we now have an orthodontist in our office, and uh-huh. he uses Itero. And I've, I've had Invisalign on myself. Actually, before this interview, I had to take out my trays just because I find uh, speaking for 30 minutes or 35 minutes uh, ends up drying out my mouth, and I end up, so I wanted to be clear. So I didn't, so I had my, my, my own scan in by the orthodontist who did my uh, Invisalign. Um, but I've done some Serac in my time, and um, I see the huge advantage of it. I see how it's clean, it's easy, it's high tech. Patients love the, the high tech side of it. They love visualizing. They love looking at the screen. Um, you know, all the toys. You know, we have a digital panel yeah. in our office. Uh, we have CBCT in our office, mm-hmm. and um, so it, it's definitely attractive. I think for patients to see that um, you're on the, you know, the cutting edge, and that you know you don't just have shag rug and um, swag lamps in your operatory. You know, you got the, <laughs> the latest stuff. So I think. Patients like to know that they're in the hands of someone who enjoys the technology. So from the, the intro cameras to, um, uh, you know, the digital panelists, you know, I think patients really appreciate it. And it's great, too. Yeah. It comes in handy to be able to email uh, referral emails to specialists on a moment's notice. Even if I have patients that go into Europe for two years and they just think it's so bizarre, I can actually email their x-ray to them. And it, it really puts yourself as a leader in the community, which is great for the overall impression and the great marketing, you know, without having yeah. to, like, be in your face marketing. Oh, yeah, that's that's great. So we, we know about your, your schooling, how you went to become a dentist. What encouraged you to go back to school to become an NSCA certified trainer and nutrition and wellness consultant? You know, I, I grew up in England, um, and my mom, even though she never went to college, never went to university, she uh-huh. was passionate about food, passionate about um, healthy eating. She read a lot of uh, Reader's Digest and Prevention Magazine back in the 60s. And she would always tell us, you know, cod liver oil is good for you. And she always told us that, um, you know, eat your vegetables and have your wheat germ and put it on your cereal. And back in the 60s, even though now they know that brown sugar is simply white sugar with a dye job, uh, she would actually put brown sugar on our cereal, telling us it was better for you. So um, a big part of my early upbringing was understanding how food can affect your body and how you did did at school. Mm -hmm. So um, as a teenager, when I got into bodybuilding and weight training, I saw how because I worked out daily, I found I was better able to manage stress than my, my student friends because they were pulling their hair out and unable to, you know, just had challenges, you know, managing a huge the tsunami of work. I found that um, working out gave me a, a peace of mind and it, and it helped keep me still in the eye of the storm. And now the exercise scientists show that um, there is definite evidence to show how people who exercise regularly um, have less of a cortisol response to emergencies, which means you stay still in the eye of the storm. So when everyone else is falling and pulling out the hair all around you, the exerciser um, um, is able to manage their amygdala, which is your primitive fight or fight part of your brain. Mm-hmm. And you're better able to make well thought out decisions than someone who doesn't exercise, which is basically, you know, 85% of the population does not have a regular exercise habit. So uh, my whole life has led, my, led me to seeing the value of fitness and nutrition. And it just plays out into every conversation I have with patients chair side. And, uh, they love it. I love it. The team loves it. So it's just part of who I am. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now, on, on that, because uh, what you're a co-author of two books, The Miracle of Health and Fit for the Love of It, can you tell us a little bit more about those books? Well, it, it's, I think it's about people always say they have a, they want to write a book someday. And I'm thinking the book happens or the book gets written if your message is unique and if people need to hear it. I think some people actually write books for marketing purposes or just, you know, as a, to build their brand. But the books that get read are the ones that have a meaningful message and it's a unique perspective. And I think if, if people keep asking you stories or please tell the story about, or what is your opinion on? And I think if enough people want to and need your unique perspective, 
a book is drawn out of you. Mm -hmm. So the first book was, for the love of it, was a self-published effort, and it sold 5,000 copies in about two years. And then um, John Wiley and Sons, and then Harper Collins came along and said, hey, we've got to get this book into print. So all of a sudden now we had a, you know, a major international uh, publisher interested in the book, and that's been sold over 5,000 copies. So it's still available on Amazon, both available on Amazon. And they're basically timeless because it's all about uh, developing a fitness mindset and uh, a nutrition philosophy which never goes out of style. You know, diets come and go, but how you feel about food and developing a nutrition philosophy is a timeless foundational perspective. And that's what these books are. So even though they're written over 10 years ago, and I do have some other books inside me now, but percolating, but I just, it's just, you know, putting the pen to paper and, and making them happen. But uh, yeah, books are a great way of getting the message out. And, and I love sharing my, uh, my passion for them and also all the other books that I love reading. I, I'm, and I always say, I, I, none of this happens alone. I, I love giving people my top, you know, three, five books to help dentists get excited about nutrition and wellness. Awesome. Now, now you mentioned about the, uh, the exercise and the diet and what about, what about the sleep? I did hear you mention that a little bit earlier. Now, a lot of dentists are stressed out. They're working on long hours, you know, get very little sleep. Do you find that sleep is the fundamental key to having a, a good day? Yeah, it, it's absolutely foundational. And I think dentists start to know about it because from a treatment perspective, you know, sleep medicine and sleep dentistry is getting bigger, but um, it's still not understand fully. Most dentists think of it as about sleep apnea. And sleep apnea definitely is under, undiagnosed. But there might be 15 million, you know, Americans with sleep apnea, you mm -hmm. know, uh, only a small percentage actually getting treated. However, one in three, which is, which is 100 million Americans, um, this is from the Center of Disease Control, say one in three people are sleep deprived, chronically sleep deprived. And... 65% of people in total are getting less than the recommended minimum seven hours a night. So the, deficient sleep is rampant. And um, some of the new research by neuroscientists are telling us that patients or, or people in general who are sleep deprived are chronically inflamed, have poor wound healing, don't process emotion well, um, have lack of discipline with habits because they're just too tired. They have poor blood sugar management. Uh, they have weaker immune systems. And they undergo accelerated, accelerated, heal, uh, healing, uh, accelerated aging. These are all things which sabotage the treatment progress in dentistry. So as dentists, if we don't understand how our patient who's a shift worker impacts the implant progress or the extraction healing, we're going to be pulling out our hair going, I wonder why this right socket happened, or I wonder why this peri-implantitis happened, because my patient's coming in every three months, they're flossing and brushing. Well, they're work you're working on a police officer or a firefighter or a first responder. They don't sleep at night, which means they have a background level of chronic inflammation, mm -hmm. which basically negatively influences the healing process. So um, I'm all about sharing sleep information during my lectures, I think. And it's from a place of not just talking about apnea and snoring. It's just you could even not have apnea and not, not snore. But if you simply don't sleep enough, um, that patient or that team member or that dentist will, ha will be sabotaging his overall cognitive functioning and physiological functioning. Gotcha. No, that's great. Um, good, good things to know. What, what about, uh, blue light? How's that affecting our health, especially at night? Yeah, a, a great question. You know, people really don't realize how much, um, our physio physiology has changed. You know, when you think of a million years plus of, of human history, um, we're basically still very much like caveman and cavewomen. Our, our genetic, uh, blueprint hasn't changed much. However, uh, back in 1905, the average, uh, North American slept anywhere from nine to 10 hours a night. 114 years later, on average, we're sleeping anywhere from five to seven hours a night. Um, so what happens is um, blue light is negatively impacting our sleep quality. Even someone who gets eight hours a night, if they're looking at screens right before bedtime, and if after seven o'clock at night, they have lots of, you know, most dentists that are doing really well and they're producing lots, will have over 50 to 100 pot lights in their beautiful home. But they don't realize every time those pot lights go on, if they go into the kitchen, their high-end kitchen with our islands and Corian and granite counters, what happens is their brain is given wake-up messages. Anytime the brain is given a wake-up message, cortisol is boosted. And cortisol is um, antithetical to melatonin. So at nighttime, our cortisol should be low and the melatonin should be high. Literally, if someone is exposed to bright light, especially blue light emitted from LED lights, computer screens, and poorly uh, adapted cell phones, mm -hmm. our melatonin is low and cortisol is high, which even though we might sleep quick, we don't stay asleep long enough and we have 
problems getting up in the middle of the night. We also don't release n- enough melatonin, which sabotages the e- immune system. So blue light is um, something that people need to look more about. Harvard did a great study with orange glasses and how they're able to block out blue light in the evening time. I wear orange glasses in the evening time. Pro athletes are wearing them. So I think as dentists, because we really are high-performance professionals, we need to treat our bodies like a high-performance race car and look into orange glasses. And um, I share some of my favorites uh, during my lectures, but um, there's a number of different companies that do a good job. If you spend anywhere over $30, uh, most dentists can get a couple of pairs. It's a great gift for the team. It's a great gift for the new patient. It's really quite remarkable how we really don't realize how much we can actually help patients' overall health simply by bringing in the sleep question and the blue light question and the orange glasses solution into our chair side conversation. Gotcha. Yeah. What What about dehydration and maintaining mental focus, especially in dentistry? Yeah. And as I said, I think most dentists think of themselves as professionals, but they don't think of themselves as being high performance athletes. I, I, just on Netflix the other night, I saw a whole drama about what uh, these race cars do. Like, so when you think of an average car in the road, most people get, they change the tires every 60,000 kilometers, uh, 40,000 miles. They, um, they get an oil change twice a year. But if you have a high-performance Formula One race car, they change tires two or three times during the race. They change the oil throughout the race. So I say to dentists and hygienists and the whole team, we need to treat ourselves like a high-performance race car. Instead of treating ourselves like just a, getting from point A to point B, if we literally started treating our body like a high-performance race car, so by staying hydrated, you know, having filtered water, sipping water throughout the day and not chugging it, you know, drinking um, green tea, hibiscus tea, drinking high-end dark roast coffee. And if we simply hydrate with some of the best fluids, we can actually maintain mental clarity. Um, a lot of professional athletes know that the minute they lose 1% to 2% of their water during a football game, mm-hmm. you lose about 3% of your cognitive functioning, which when you think about a dentist making key diagnostic opinions and you know, um, going with the flow and trying to, um, uh, uh, you know, be flexible in the middle of a treatment when a patient is gagging or something new pops up. We need to be cognitively sharp. So if someone's dehydrated, it basically sabotages our making good executive functioning where um, you can, it can make or break your treatment plan or make or make or break your afternoon simply by being dehydrated and not knowing why you're tired or your, your memory's off. Meanwhile, dehydration, you know, it's not necessarily you're lacking food. It's simply by being dehydrated. That's a cheap way to enhance our overall physiology and cognitive functioning. Gotcha. Now, out of curiosity here, Dr. Uchi, what, uh, what is your daily workout routine? Are you working out at the gym or at home? And, and are there certain times a day? Yeah, great. Yeah, that's good. I love you ask that question. Because most people think I, by looking at me, most people think I work out harder than I do. And my, I wrote an article, The Exercise When Less Is More. And it's all about the value of intermittent or interval training. Interval training is all about the new science of high intensity, low intensity. So in the middle of a five to 10 minute workout bout, if you go back and forth between low intensity, high intensity, you can literally get the same or better benefit than someone working out for an hour. So uh, Martin Gabala out of Ontario, he's an exercise physiologist, mm-hmm. uh, wrote a book called The One Minute Workout. And literally he talks about three 20 second high intensity um, splurges of intensity on a treadmill or stationary bike in the middle of a seven minute total workout and how it's literally better for you and better improving your max VO2 or improving cardiovascular and aerobic function better than a steady state workout. I would say that a steady state workout now is like working out like 1990s. Like it's like working out with, you know, MC hammer pants on, you know, (laughs) Um, uh, the new way to train 2019 and 2020 and beyond is to do interval training. And basically you don't have to work out for an hour. You know, um, lack of time is number one reason why, why dentists don't exercise. And mm. literally, by doing interval training, by working out five to seven minutes a day only doing interval training, you can grab your life back. And you can get the same benefit as someone working out for an hour. So, and I have the article I can make available to your uh, listeners. It's called Exercise But Less Is More. It's a five-page article. I explain the benefits of um, interval training and how you can work it in with any other kind of program and how it's simply a must if someone's a busy person in 2020 and beyond. Yeah, yeah, we'll make sure and have those links uh, below the uh, the podcast here when we publish. Um, now, now we all tend to experience that 2 p.m. crash. Are there quick workouts that we can do to stretch the body and boost our energy? Yeah, you know, what? the thing is that that 2 p.m. crash is totally normal. Our physiology, our body naturally cools between 2 and 4 p.m. We naturally get a little dull. Um, a lot of car accidents happen 
and a lot of uh, 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 all kinds of accidents happen to you in forest. People get cool, and then the body cools; it wants to go to sleep. So the, the you know the Spanish, the Italians, and the Spaniards know about the afternoon siesta, and it naturally coincides with the body's desire to shut down for two hours. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying you got to not book patients between two and four p.m. I'm just saying don't do a lot of high tech, um, high touch procedures during two and four. And do them in the morning when you're cognitively and physiologically at, at, at your best. But that two to four um, can definitely be made worse by a high carb lunch, or a donut infused pasta, white rice infused lunch, or if someone's dehydrated, or if someone snores, or if someone stays up late watching movies on their laptop till midnight. So um, if someone gets seven to nine hours of sleep, if someone eats a high protein lunch, if someone stays hydrated. Um, you can actually definitely take the edge and not be so dull during that two to four low. Um, even having a piece of 70% dark chocolate around one to two o'clock can give you that bit of an edge and it floods your body with um, flavonoids and um, phytonutrients that basically increases cognitive function. It also lowers cortisol. There's actually the studies that show how having 70, 70% dark chocolate, a couple of squares mid-afternoon actually lowers cortisol, which makes your brain sharper and you make less mistakes. That's awesome. No, I really appreciate yeah. you sharing that. Um, now, now, does does your entire does the rest of your family work out too, or do you find that you're mainly kind of pushing pushing that level? <laughs> yeah, great question. It's it, it, it's really easier to work out and train hard when you have a team. Like mm-hmm. if you have a partner that exercises, if you have a team that exercises, you can basically push and nurture and inspire each other. You know, Jim Rohn, uh, America's business philosopher, um, who's now passed on. He said, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, he said, if you look at the five people you spend the most time with and look at their incomes and average out their income, you will actually get your income level. And many listeners right now are thinking, I need new friends, <laughs> okay? But <laughs> I extrapolate that to fitness. I said, if you look at the five people in your life who you spend the most time with and you average out their fitness level, you would actually find your fitness level. So sometimes getting in shape and getting healthy and having more energy It's not just an an aspect of finding the right trainer or finding the right sneakers. It's about finding people who inspire you, finding people who order different things on the menu and hanging out with different people who read different books than you do. Hanging out with people who actually, um, you know, instead of driving to the coffee shop, actually walk to the coffee shop. Uh, It's looking at people who look at a dark roasted coffee and looking at their fiber content and the antioxidants inside rather than looking at the thousand calorie dessert coffees. So being in shape can definitely be made easier if people in your life who are fitter, but if you can't, if you have no fitness people in your life, I always tell people, you know, just look at people who um, online, you can have virtual friendships. You can join Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. You can follow Dr. Uchi on his Instagram, you know, and you can join my posse. And I often, you know, post two to four times a day and I read the most obscure exercise scientific journals and I make sense of them. I post on them and people without even having to become a certified trainer, can distill the latest information on interval training, intermittent fasting, on the microbiome. It's really quite neat how I can actually really help thousands of people without never having met them. Hmm. So that's just a huge element of uh, gratitude for me that I can help so many uh, without having to be physically in their orbit. Yeah, no, that's a, that's absolutely wonderful. Now, for people who are trying to build healthier habits, do you have any any tips that you could share with us? Okay, immediately I would say uh, people like to buy stuff. So um, I can tell people without having to understand how it works. Like a lot of people use uh, the electric light without having to understand about ohms and impedance and electricity, mm-hmm. without having to fully understand the human microbiome and the new science of, the, of your gut flora, is people should try and have at least two uh, food items that are fermented every day. Because anytime you eat fermented foods, they have prebiotic and probiotic qualities. Um, th- these are what your good flora in your gut loves. So if someone could at least have two of these a day, and I'll name seven. Um, so miso soup, um, a good quality cheese, plain yogurt, kefir, kimchi, apple cider vinegar, kombucha, good quality pickles or sauerkraut. If people at least have two of these and add them into their diet every day, it'll start calming down your gut flora. It'll bring balance and stability to your gut flora. And anytime you have balance and stability to your gut flora, everything in your body works better. Cravings go down, the immune system is stronger, you have more energy, you get leaner, it balances blood sugar, and it makes your immune system stronger. So it's an all over easy go to. So the first thing that any listener could do is try and have at least two 
fermented foods a day. So a piece of cheese, it could be some miso soup, or it could be just having plain yogurt every day for the rest of your life, as long as you're lactose tolerant, obviously. But yeah. um, that's probably my easiest tip right away. So that, that's one. Two, try and stand when you're on the phone. Um, anytime I'm standing when I'm on the phone, I burn another 200 calories a day, which it doesn't seem like much until you do it 30 days in a row. So you can actually lose one pound a month simply by standing when you're on the phone. <laughs> and you can actually in a year blow off and get leaner by 10 pounds simply by always standing when you're talking on the phone. That's my second one. Three, buy yourself a sleep mask. Because they've actually shown that if you wear a sleep mask, your pineal gland gets, gets no light. And when your pineal gland is not getting any light through your eyelids from having a sleep mask at nighttime, your body makes more melatonin. Anytime your melatonin is higher because it's a pitch black room where you're wearing a sleep mask, your body has a stronger immune system. Anytime your immune system is stronger, you manage blood sugar better, and you're less likely to have or develop chronic disease. And the overall systemic inflammation goes down in the body. So you live healthier, longer. So that's easy. So fermented food, sleep mask, stand when you talk on the phone. How easy is that? Yeah, no doubt. Thanks for sharing those, Dr. Uchi. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, now, now with 2020 coming up, do you have any upcoming events or seminars? Yeah, I'm, I'm all over. You know, what, what happens is whenever you start being passionate about a message and you explain it in a way that get, gets people excited. And I think a lot of experts, after hearing them talk, it sounds more complicated. Mm-hmm. I like to do is I like to make a complicated subject easier and effortlessly. So um, I'm in Kansas City in January, January 10th in Kansas City at their, at their, um, at their state meeting. I'm at Niagara on the lake. I'm doing a full day, and it's called 50 Shades of Inflammation, French Flies, F- Flossing, and Fitness. Um, some big courses I'm at next year are I'm in uh, I'm at the Chicago Midwinter Meeting. I'm doing three courses during the Chicago Midwinter Meeting. There'll be like thirty thousand people there during those three days in Chicago. I'll be uh, in Atlanta for the, for the for the huge Hinman Meeting. I think I'm speaking five times. I'm going to be at the um, the ADA annual session in Orlando. I think they have me doing five different courses during those five days. I'm at the New York Meeting, so the the Greater New York Dental Meeting. I think I'm doing two courses. Um, I'm in Seattle at the Pacific Northwest Dental Conference in June, or it's in May, I think, this year. So I'm literally in 35 different cities. So the best way to, for people to find out where I am is uh, just uh, um, go to drucci.com, so D-R-U-C-H-E.com, and look at my schedule. And I don't have my new schedule up yet, but they can actually message me, text me, email me, and they can find a city where I'm going to be just to get they, – they can bring the whole team. And I always find when teams learn together, yeah. they grow together, and they become more productive together. Well, certainly. Now, now with uh, new dentists coming into the field, do you have any advice that you'd be willing to share uh, for them to have a, a better path through dentistry? Yeah, I think a lot of new dentists, uh, they sacrifice their health. Mm-hmm. You know, just because they have a you know, half million dollar student loan to, to pay back, they have a half million dollar private, pra- you know, private practice purchase loan to pay back. They might be newly married. They might have a baby on the way. And why do they think, I'm just going to work 50, 60 hours a week? And, and what happens is they sacrifice their health for the first 40 years. So between, between you know, 25 and 50, a lot of dentists sacrifice their health to make more money, which is noble. However, in the second half of their life, they will be paying back lots of money to get their health back. So if you don't treat your body well in the first half, you will be spending more money to get your knee back, your disc back, your eyes back, your brain back, your rotator cuff back in the second half. And it's more expensive and it's a painful rehab. So all new dentists, I said, dig the well before you're thirsty. You know, get fit before you're, you're in the rehab office trying to get the bulging disc down. So the new dentist needs to hire a trainer, go to a group exercise class, you know, take a, a one a yoga class a week to, to develop flexibility, wear those sleep masks, you know, take a probiotic daily to harmonize their, their uh, the gut flora, and really dig the well before they're thirsty. So we're so instead of waiting till your disc is bulging and you're having, you know, uh, mental exhaustion at 48 with three practices, you know, do it while you're, you're not tapped out. And you'll find that the, the, the huge amount of monetary investment most dentists spend in the second half of life trying to get the health back is much cheaper. And as, as dentists know, prevention is cheap, but yeah. it, we don't do it with our bodies and end up spending big money, 48 bucks, trying to get our health back. So dig the well before you're thirsty, you dentist. Most excellent. Well, Dr. Uchi, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, to meet with us here today on the podcast. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, I, I love sharing. You know, and people always think it's, it's so easy that I've had such an easy time, and they go, oh, it "Must be nice," you know, Mister Fitness and all this stuff. I just want to remind Dennis, I haven't had it so easy. Um, back in 2004, our uh, our first child was born with special needs, you know, medical seizure and feeding disorder. He was tube fed, and for the first eight and a half years of his life, he wasn't doing well. And even though we had two other children, what happened was this little baby boy, being medically fragile, passed away in 2013. And it took the wind out of my sails. It took everything I could uh, not to be addicted to anything and to stay strong. And using faith, family, and fitness, I was better able to weather that storm of a personal load. Can you imagine you have 1,500 patients and you're trying to treatment plan and do new patient exams and be happy and cheery seeing emergency patients. And at home, you have a special needs child who has a bleak outlook, outlook and health outcome. And then having him pass away, and then still having three children at home, healthy babies, trying to take care of. So it hasn't always been easy. But what's made me, uh, what's made my immune system impenetrable and unstoppable is having that nice balance of um, faith and fitness, which has allowed me to stay strong in the eye of the storm. So it hasn't been easy. But I found you know, when, when life hits you with a two by four, if you're fit, you can weather that storm and get back up. You know, I love what Les Brown says. Even if you get knocked, knocked back down, if you land on your back and you can look up, you can get up. And I think fitness allows your body the physiological reserve so you can weather those emotional, financial, personal, marital storms with, that inevitably happen in most of our lives. And um, so that's it's my last parting remarks. I don't think I have it so easy. Like I've had my own personal and, you know, family storms and fitness has, has allowed me to see the light and allows me to keep going in a positive fashion. Wow. Yeah. No kidding. That's uh that's rather impactful. Thank you for, for sharing that with us, doctor. And yeah, certainly a wonderful outlook and really good advice. Um, well, yeah, thank you. I, it's been a pleasure. I, I thank you for your insightful questions. They've been great. And I, I really hope the listeners uh, get the message that fitness can be easy. It's fun. And it's much more than looking great on Facebook. It, it, it helps your brain work better and helps you be a bit better dentist overall. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure and have all of your social media links below also to help people be able to get in touch with you easily and uh, be able to follow. And uh, again, I just want to say thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. And I thank you for giving me my message, another voice. And uh, hopefully there's one or two dentists out there that get the message and um, get fit and get happy and enjoy a long, uh, productive career. Excellent. Thanks so much. Bye bye. That's it. Yeah, have a good day. Thanks for joining us on the Dental Love Podcast Show this week. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or search the Dental Love Podcast on iTunes for our weekly feed. Don't forget to visit KeatingDentalArts.com slash promo for exclusive offers. Keating Dental Arts is a full-service dental laboratory, and we're nationwide. We'd love for you to send us a case so we can show you the Keating difference. If you dig what you heard, please leave a review on iTunes, and we'll be back next week.